Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this special virtual event, the post-midterm market outlook. I am your host, Damon King. I'm a certified financial planner, professional, and wealth management advisor to millionaires with Chapelwood Financial Services. Now, those of you who are uh, from coast to coast, we've got people all over the place, and we're located in beautiful Edmond, Oklahoma, which is just north of the downtown Oklahoma City area. And uh, I wanted to do today's event because we just finished up strategy meetings with many, many, the vast majority of our clients in the month of October. And obviously, a big topic of conversation is the market. It's been a rough year. There's no doubt about that. It's been a rough year. You open up your qu quarterly statements and you just want to cry uh, because there's some big numbers in there, big negative numbers, right? Now, the conventional wisdom tells you, well, you haven't really lost anything until you sell. And that is true, but it's still not fun, right? And we went over and shared a lot of the reasons why we are where we are, and more importantly, what do we, what has been done in your portfolio and what remains to be done. But I wanted to get outside and, and, and back up and take a broader view, not just talk about investments. Number one, many of you, I'm not your advisor, so it would be inappropriate for me to give you investment advice. I'm not giving any investment advice today, just so you know. We're not giving any tax advice, nothing like that. This is straight up education, and I want you to see the economy and the market the way I see it, the way we see it as professionals. What is it that we have shared with our clients, and why do we believe what we believe? So throughout today's presentation, I want you to ask a question anytime you want to. You can use either the chat button or the Q&A button down below in your toolbox. It should be down uh, kind of at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I will answer your questions here live on today's broadcast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, get into this. And if I can get the screens, there we go. All right, so what are we gonna discuss today? I've broken this down and, and I'm taking you kind of on a journey. So if you'll take a journey with me, this is how we're gonna get there. So how did we get here? What has happened to get us into this mess that we're in? What's the story on inflation and interest rates? Are we in a recession? Ooh, now that's a provocative question, right? A lot of people say we're already in a recession. A lot of people say no. What's the real story? And what is the outlook for the market in 2023? And more specifically, what is our outlook? We don't really know. Nobody knows. If we all knew, you wouldn't need me. You wouldn't need any other financial advisor. You would go out and just do it, right? So obviously what we're going to share in terms of our outlook, they're, they're educated estimates, all right? They're, they're educated, not predictions, but projections of what we think is going to happen next year based on history and what typically happens when the Fed does its thing and when the market do their things. All right, plus of course, we're going to answer your questions throughout today's show. And of course, and anytime you have a question, please put it in the screen there. So let's start with our big question number one. How did we get here? How did we get to this place where we entered a bear market and it's been such a rough year? Well, really we gotta go back a couple of years, right? What we're experiencing right now is really a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so let's go back a couple of years because none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. You have to have context. And these, it's like a story. One thing leads to another. So the economy shuts down during the pandemic uh, spring of 2020. And what happens? Well, we can't get out and buy anything. And we lost 26 million jobs. The economy was in a recession. Did you know? We entered a recession, okay, from a, from a market high at that point. It took us about a month to enter a recession. Recessions usually happen over time. We went into a recession in a month, and it was a deep recession. We shut the economy down, right? 
So in order to rescue the economy, what happens? Well, that's when Congress authorizes a bunch of stimulus spending. And of course, the Federal Reserve in response basically lowered rates to zero. Now, what's interesting about that is that coming out of 2019, the Federal Reserve had actually begun to raise interest rates. You may not remember this. There was actually in their December 2019 meeting, the Fed actually raised interest rates. And there was every indication that they were going to continue to raise rates slowly because we had had 11 years of low rates and, and stimulus following the 2008 financial crisis. And it was time to begin raising rates back up. And that was the plan. And then all of a sudden, this new mysterious virus that we call coronavirus, and now we call it COVID, began inching across the globe. And pretty soon, it came to the United States. So a bunch of stimulus spending. And the Federal Reserve basically just printed money. Whee! It was a, it was a money printing extravaganza. Now, at that time, you can make the argument it was necessary. It was necessary to save the economy. We had to have the life vests thrown out. Okay, the, the, the rescue boys were thrown out. Now here we are two years later. What's changed? Well, what's changed is that the economy has finally opened back up. And through much of 2021, it was the recovery year and it was the year of the vaccine, right? So 2020 was the year of the virus. 2021 was the year of the vaccine and the recovery. And it wasn't until the end of 2021 and spilling over into 2022 that all of that pent up demand, all of that desire to get out again, to go out to a restaurant, instead of having to pick it up at the curb, to go to see a movie instead of streaming on Netflix, to actually see human beings face to face instead of like this. All that pent up demand got expressed largely in 2022. However, what did not catch up was the economy and, and production, right? So this inflation that we're seeing right now is a result of all the government spending that was done to save the economy, but it's taken time to get to where we are. Now we see high demand, high consumer demand. As you're going to see later on, consumer spending is still very strong, but we have low supply. Now, for the longest time, we had low supply of goods. Now we have low supply in services, and specifically, a low supply of labor. There's a labor shortage. So that's what's causing the inflation right now. So this bed that we're sleeping in was made two years ago. It didn't just happen. Well, now we also have rising interest rates. So inflation has creeped up on us. And now it's in outer space, right? Now, some of you who were alive as adults during the 70s and 80s, oh, you're like, this, this is not inflation. We, we've seen this. And this is not interest rates. Okay, I was born in 1976. I just turned 46 two days ago. Many of my clients who are 20 years older than me, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, seven and a half percent for a mortgage. And they're sitting there saying, yeah, dude, come back and talk to me when you've got 15 or 18 percent. And then and then we can talk. OK, because they remember the 80s, right, when interest rates were just astronomically high. So it's all about context, right? It's about your perspective. But the Fed is raising interest rates white right now. Why? The Fed basically has two weapons to fight back against inflation. One of those is to what we call reduce their balance sheet, okay? And what does that mean? You hear that tossed around. What does reducing the Fed's balance sheet mean? It means the, the way the Fed injects money into our system is to buy bonds. They buy US treasuries, they buy bonds, and during COVID, they bought corporate bonds. They bought, if it was a bond, the Fed was buying it, right? And when they buy those bonds, it injects money into the financial system that we can then use to borrow and spend, right? Which then triggers economic growth. And then it also helps to stimulate the stock. But now what the Fed is doing is they are allowing many of those bonds. They're not selling bonds. They're simply not renewing them. And so the ones that are maturing, they're simply letting those drop off their balance sheet. And therefore, it reduces the amount of money supply in the system. And they're tightening the system a little bit. 
The other thing they do, they raise interest rates. What does raising interest rates do? We're going to get into that in just a little bit. Consumer spending. Consumer spending is 70% of our gross domestic product. All right, it's not our trade with China. Our trade with China represents less than 1% of our total economic output. Remember a few years ago when the trade war with China was a big deal? It's not a big deal. It might feel like a big deal, and it was portrayed to be a big deal in the media. Our trade with China accounts for less than 1% of our total gross domestic product. Not that big of a deal. What is a big deal? Consumer spending. It's you and me. When we spend money, we drive the economy. So a lot of that inflation we're seeing right now, it's a direct result of maybe overspending by the government, but it's also a direct result of us expressing all of that pent up demand and we continue to spend some money. So we are helping to drive inflation, which is then driving interest rates and the cycle continues. As I mentioned, there's a labor shortage. Well, when there's a labor shortage, labor, the laws of supply and demand ap apply to labor just as much as it applies to goods. When there aren't as many people able and willing to work, what does that do for those that are? It drives up their price. So now companies, in order to attract talented people, have to pay more to get that talent. And that drives up salaries and wages. Well, when companies have to pay more to acquire talent, who do they pass that cost on to? Us, right? So isn't this like, it's like a perfect storm, right? It's a perfect storm of garbage <laughs> that has caused this situation that we're in. And then, of course, we have the political climate, both domestically and internationally. So the geopolitical climate, and as we're going to see later, especially in a midterm year, politics creates uh, uncertainty and fear. And when we feel fearful about the future, when we're uncertain about what our future holds or is going to look like, that tends to be reflected in how we invest in the stock market. So all of this stuff has played a role into why we are where we are right now. And I've shared all of this, or most of it, with our clients. So if this is the first time you're kind of really digesting all of this, congratulations. Now you get a peek into side, inside of the dumpster fire that has been in my brain <laughs> all year long. All right, so let's, let's move on. So well, let's go to big question number two. And, it's, and we're, now we're gonna dive a little deeper into each one of these things. So what's the story on inflation and interest rates? Well, inflation remains persistently high, but it is falling. In fact, I'm going to show you a, a graphic here in just a moment to show you how inflation is falling. Consumer spending has moved from spending on goods to now spending on services. And that kind of inflation on services is much stickier than goods. All right, what does that mean? Well, when the economy was shut down and we couldn't go out. And do, most of the jobs that were lost, the 26 million jobs that were lost, they were lost in the service sector. Basically, any job that was at a company that required you to be less than six feet apart. So again, that's restaurants, it's movie theaters, it's theme parks, it's airplanes, it's cruise ships, that kind of stuff. But people were still going to Home Depot and Lowe's. I remember in the depths of the, of the, the pandemic, I would drive by Home Depot, I would drive by Lowe's, and the parking lots were full. It was a ghost town every place else, but Home Depot and Lowe's were killing it, right? Do you remember that? Because everybody was like, well, honey, you know, we've been meaning to do all these home projects, can't go do anything else, so let's go get it done, right? That kind of inflation is a lot easier to get rid of. Why? Because you know, people just stop spending their money on those things. And then inflation comes down. Demand goes down, inflation goes down, prices come down. But services, that's harder. Why? Because that's the fun stuff we like. It's really hard to get consumers to change their spending patterns on services. Going out to eat, going on trips. Rent, when you pay your rent, actually rent is considered a service. Did you know that? Rent is not a good. You're not buying the house. 
you're buying a service to be able to live in this house or apartment. So rent has gone up and that's included as a service in consumer spending. Now, consumer spending accounts for 70% of overall GDP, but you can break that spending down further into two parts, spending on goods and spending on services. Two thirds of all consumer spending is on services. That is the largest component of the consumer spending component, which is the largest component of GDP. So that, that's why the economy is on fire right now. That's why we see an inflation spike like we have, because all that pent up demand is now being expressed in a totally different sector of consumer spending. And that just happens to be the sector section of consumer spending that's harder to curb inflation, all right? And then the Federal Reserve has pledged to continue raising rates to combat inflation. The Federal Reserve has two key mandates and then a third one that's less important. Mandate number one, stabilize inflation, keep inflation in a manageable level. What's a manageable level of inflation? Eh, two and a half to three percent. That's kind of the sweet spot. Some inflation is actually important. We need it. People think, isn't inflation bad? Well, depends on how you look at it. You may not like paying more for prices for stuff, but do you like getting paid more? Do you like getting raises from your employer? If you do, then every year you get a raise. Well, how is your employer paying for that raise? They're not just eating that cost. They're passing it on to consumers, right? That's how inflation happens. We expect to be paid more, so we get more, and our companies pass those costs on to their end consumers. When you get more money, what do you do? You spend more money. And when it costs more to live, it costs you. And it's this cycle, right? So some inflation is important because it means economic growth, but too much is bad because it stifles economic growth. So the Fed is doing everything they can to meet mandate number one, stabilize inflation. Now they're doing a great job with mandate number two, and that is stabilize employment. Keep unemployment low. Unemployment is still very, very low. It's starting to tick up just a bit. But unemployment is very low. Now, the third mandate that they have is actually one that was added on a little bit later. So I let's call it 2A, all right? And that is to stabilize the stock market. But that mandate is subordinate to the other two mandates. As a result, the Fed really doesn't care as much about what happens to the market. It cares more about inflation. The Fed is a hammer, inflation is a nail, and they're going to pound that into the ground. And that is why we see them continue to raise interest rates and why Chairman Powell in this month, when they raised interest rates, as we all expected, 75 basis points or 0.75%. I don't know if you were watching the market on that day. I always like to watch the market on Fed days because I like to, I don't listen to what the Fed chairman is saying. I like to watch what the S&P does, and I try to predict what he just said. I like to play a little game with myself. So I knew the rate increase was going to happen, so then I watched the S&P. And the announcement was made at 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern. And for about 10 minutes, the market just went whoosh like that. And I thought, oh, they must have said the magic word. We're going to lower the rate increases. Aha, goody, goody. But then something else happened. In a span of like a minute, the market started to go down. Why? I thought, oh, what did he say? He must have said something bad because the market's throwing a temper tantrum. And he did. He said, we're going to slow the rate of the increases, but we're not going to stop raising rates. And number two, our top target rate has now gone from maybe four and a half percent to five or more, right? So they're going to slow the level of the rate increases, but now they've got a bigger target, which means they might be raising rates for even longer. So it's to me, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see how this all works. Now, here's inflation. So you can see that the monthly 12-month inflation rate has started to edge down. You'll notice I got to move my picture out of the way here. So it peaked, what is that, in June at 
And then July 8.5, August 8.2, September 7.7, October, it came down even more, okay? So we're starting to see inflation come down. We're starting to see the work that the Federal Reserve has been doing. It's starting to have an impact, all right? And if you'll just bear with me one moment, I'll be right back. I've got to open the door real quick here. All right, that's the danger of doing live broadcast. You get little interruptions here and there. All right, so I'm back. So now inflation is coming down, but here's what's interesting about inflation. You have to understand how this is. When you hear the inflation number every month, you might be tempted to believe that that inflation number you're hearing is measuring the month over month change in prices, that October is being compared to September of this year. That's not true. What the inflation number is measuring is the year over year change in prices. So it's comparing September of last year to September of this year, October of last year to October of this year. And that's a very important point for this reason. So take a look at this chart. Let's, let's pick out June of 2022, the 9.1, and let's go back to June of 2021, and what is that? Uh, about 5.4%, okay? That's where inflation was at that time, or prices, and that was a measurement comparing to June of 2020. Well, June of 2020, what was going on? The entire freaking country was shut down. There was hardly any spending going on. Look at it. And now we get to June of 2021. The vaccine has been introduced. Lots of people are getting it and things are starting to open up. Now all that pent up demand begins to get expressed. It's no surprise that prices shot up from June 2020 to June of 2021, right? It's no surprise. And then that continued on into 2022. It's no surprise that prices in June of 2022 are higher than June of 2021 because the demand train kept on rocking and now we have a labor shortage. So you see how these things work? So all of those numbers, those inflation numbers at the beginning of 2022, look what they're being compared to at the same time a year ago, much lower rates of price increase. But now look what's happening at the back end of 2022. Those numbers are being compared to higher numbers at the back end of 2021. So as we progress, we are going to begin seeing the inflation numbers come down simply because the rate of change is going to be much smaller because it's being compared to a higher number a year previous. Does that make sense? So I wanted you to understand that when you hear the inflation number, it doesn't mean that prices went up 7.2% one month or eight point whatever. It's comparing it to the same year 12 months before. And it's just that at the beginning of this year, we were comparing high price months to low price months, but now they're starting to catch up. So that's the story on inflation and it is starting to come down. And when the October number was uh, announced, not surprisingly, the market had a fantastic day. It was a day last week, the S&P 500 was up 5%, 5% in one day because the inflation number came down. Why is that important? Because if inflation is slowing, then it's a signal, an indicator to the market that maybe the Federal Reserve will be able to stop raising rates at all or slow their rate increases at all or maybe lower their target. And that's what's driving all of this. It's interest rates. The threat of interest rates continue to go up. So let's talk about interest rates. Where do we think those are going to end? Well, in this chart right here, you'll see that for 2022, you'll see the rate increases that we've had. Now, the market expects the top end rate going into 2024 to um, stabilize out around 4.2% and then maybe drop off slowly over there. But the actual projection, all right, the estimates from the Federal Open Market Committee, so the FOMC is the committee at the Fed that actually sets these rates, 
their estimates are a little bit higher. So see, that's what triggered the big sell-off in September when Fed Chairman Powell came out and said, no, we're, we, we're not going to stop. Or maybe it was August. We're not stopping. And then when he said our top target is probably higher than what the market is expecting, that's when you get a sell-off, right? When the market doesn't get what it expects, it throws a tantrum. But that's where we are with rates. And I'm going to share with you here in just a minute what my expectation is for interest rates. But this is where we're at right now. The Fed is probably going to raise rates a little higher than what the market is expecting right now. What does that mean? It means that there's more volatility coming. This isn't over. We're not out of this by a long shot. There's more volatility coming, and it's because of the uncertainty over the future of interest rates. All right, so why is the Fed so focused on inflation? I touched on this just a moment ago. Controlling inflation and stabilizing the labor market are the Fed's two core mandates. Persistently high inflation makes it difficult to stabilize the market, and as a result, they're trying to keep it down. They would rather sh sacrifice the short-term health of the market than the long-term health of the economy. A lot of people look at this and say, then why does the Fed keep doing this? If it's hurting the market, why do they keep doing it? It's because they have to. Painful as it is, they have to keep doing this in order to get inflation under control. We can't allow inflation to consistently stay at 7, 8, 9% because the result would be consumers would just stop spending. And as we've already uh, shown, consumer spending drives the economy. If consumer spending just collapses, so too does our economy. Much better to ease us down. So they talk about bring us in for that soft landing as opposed to just fall out of the sky. That's why they're so focused on inflation, to stabilize prices and stabilize the labor market, even if it comes at the expense of your 401k. Now, there are ways to try to immunize yourself against that. And that's what we've been talking about with our clients. We've been making shifts in portfolios. Uh, this year, we've seen shifts away from growth stocks to dividend stocks. Dividends have been outperforming growth, meaning they haven't lost as much, okay? Um, there's been an opportunity to shift your bond portfolio. You know, as interest rates go up, your bond values go down, right? It's an opportunity to maybe sell off some of those lower paying bonds in exchange for lower priced bonds that are now paying a higher rate. If you've been going for high yield bonds, which are higher risk, and you were doing that because investment grade corporate bonds were paying one or 2%, whatever. Well, now you don't need those riskier high yield bonds because you can get higher yields by taking on less risky investment grade corporate bonds that are now paying five, 6%. Right. So those are some of the things that you can think about. There are opportunities in this market. Many of our clients in their after tax accounts, it's a great time to harvest losses, right? To offset taxes. Maybe you're thinking about a Roth conversion. Right before this uh, broadcast today, I had two clients that came in. We're looking at a Roth conversion this year. Number one, the tax rates are lower from now through the end of 2025. So when are you going to pay the tax on that money? Eventually, would you rather pay it when the rates are lower or when they're higher? But the other thing is that if you convert while the market's down, when the market rebounds and it's in Roth, that growth is going to be tax-free, right? So there are opportunities in a down market. It isn't all just doom and gloom. Quarterly statement doesn't look good, but you've got to go beyond the statement. Got to go beyond the statement. All right. Big question number three, are we in a recession? And if not, will we be? So this is the big one, right? There's a lot of disagreement about this question, the answer. So let's talk about it. Who officially decides or declares that the United States economy is in recession? They're called the National Bureau of Economic Research. It's a think tank. And they are the ones that officially declare when we have been in a recession. Now, the most commonly followed definition for recession is two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth or negative GDP. And we did have that 
first and second quarter of 2022, negative GDP. Now, there are reasons why that was negative. We didn't actually have negative GDP. What ended up happening? There was so much demand in our country that we did not have the manufacturing capacity to create all the goods that were being bought. So what do we have to do to make up that gap? We have to import more. And when we import more, that is a negative against our GDP. It's subtracted out. So when we increased our exports, that actually dragged our GDP negative. That's why we had negative GDP. Of course, you don't really hear that talked about a lot in the news because the news doesn't have time to get into that much detail about it. But that's why we had negative GDP. Now, third quarter was positive. All right, so is the recession over? Well, according to the NBER, we've never been in a recession. So the recession can't be over, right? So what do they look at? They consider more than just GDP. Here are some of the things that they look at. They look at employment levels. So they, you know, is, is employment low or is it high? Real personal consumption expenditures, okay? Consumer spending. How much are we spending? Consumer spending is off the charts. Still very high. It is coming down, but it's still very high. Unemployment is still very low. Industrial production, manufacturing. GDP is one data point. It would be like looking a doctor looking at a patient and to make a diagnosis of what is wrong with them. Clearly, there's something wrong with them, but they don't know exactly what it is. It would be like simply taking the patient's temperature and saying, yep, you've got flu. You got a temperature, you got a, you got a fever, so that's the flu, yeah. Okay, what other factors are you considering to determine if that's really what it is? Maybe it's strep throat. Maybe it's, I don't know, an infection of some kind. You know, bacterial, I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Ellen... You raised your hand. Let me see if I can find you here. Or well, maybe you put it down. Did you put it down, Ellen? I think you did. Okay. If you have a question, Ellen, you can raise your hand. Okay, there she goes. Uh, Ellen, I'm gonna allow you to talk. I'm gonna bring you on right now. So Ellen, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, Damon, I wonder if you have a slide that gives us some idea comparatively how Oklahoma is doing compared to this chart. That's a great question, Ellen. I don't have that level of, um, I, I haven't drilled down into that level, but mm -hmm. this is obviously, yeah, it's gonna be on a case by case basis. And and Ellen to take it another step further, and this may be where you're leading, cause I've got heard it. It's like, well, look, I don't care if the country's in a recession. I sure am, you know, I sure feel like I am. And as far as Oklahoma goes, I'll say this, our economy has been strengthened because we have such a focus on energy. There are two sectors of the of the market that have performed very well this year, and it's energy and real estate. So energy prices being elevated, now they've come back down, but I honestly think they're going to go back up. Um, the Oklahoma economy is buoyed, as it always has been, by, uh, by strong energy prices. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. I don't really have any detail on that, but uh, it is an interesting question. But obviously, the... Um... The rates that we have to pay to borrow, et cetera, are all off of this chart. Um, actually, this is not necessarily interest rates. This is more of what does the National Bureau of Economic Research look at in terms of declaring a recession? So the more of these factors that are negative, the more likely it is that we are in a recession. And so that's really what I'm trying to show with this is that the negative GDP number, that's one data point. And that's the one that the media often talks about. And it's the most widely accepted definition. But those that actually determine if we're in a recession or we're in a recession, they look at more than just that. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. But yeah. again, from a personal standpoint, yeah, you may, you may feel like I'm in a recession because I've cut back on my spending. I can't go do all the things that I want to do. Um, maybe you have personally lost a job. Not you, Ellen, but you know, others out there, they've lost their job. And that's a recession, right? When, you're, when your ability to generate income 
has been taken away from you. So, uh, did you? Uh, thank you so much for your que uh, question, Ellen. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. And if you have another one, I'll I'll bring you back on. So, great question. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, and if anybody, if anybody else has any questions, please uh, share down below, or you can raise your hand and I'll let you talk here if you'd like to. So let's get back to this. Are we in a recession? Oh, let's talk about consumer spending. So consumers continue to spend. As you can see here, consumer spending has not fallen. Now it did in the depths of 2020 in the lockdown, but look where it is right now. That is not an indicator of an economy that is slowing down or in recession going backward. If consumer spending is 70% of GDP, that chart right there tells a completely different story, right? So again, remember, GDP was negative in quarter one and two because this level of spending outstripped our nation's ability to provide the goods that were wanted and needed. And we had to import more, which was a negative against our total GDP for that quarter. And then take a look at unemployment. Unemployment is back to pre-pandemic levels. We lost 26 million jobs. We've gained every single one of those jobs back. This is also not something you would see in an economy that is in recession. You would not see growing consumer spending and record low unemployment. What you would see, so, so we are not in a recession yet. Okay, now that is my official position. We are not in a recession yet. You may disagree with me, and that's okay. That's okay. We can agree to disagree, but there's reasons why we believe we're not in a recession. The GDP is not the only reason. Strong consumer spending, low unemployment, and if we were in a recession, I promise you, the Fed would not be raising interest rates, they would be lowering them. We would see the opposite of everything we see now. Now, even though we're not in a recession yet, I do believe we likely will be sometime in 23. The probability of recession in the next 12 months is climbing. Why? See, it's not important. It's important for me to know, for you to know what I'm thinking, but I want you to know why I'm thinking it. The Fed is likely going to raise rates three more times, December of this year and February and March of next year. We've already started to see companies uh, hiring less, or they put a freeze on their hiring, and in some cases, layoffs. Consumer spending is starting to fall slightly, and it will continue to fall. If inflation stays where it's at, and it's only coming down slowly, eventually people will start to spend less. And when they spend less, corporate earnings will begin to fall. So what is our expectation? Our expectation is that a recession will be declared sometime in the second quarter of 2023. That's our best estimate right now, just based on what we're tracking and, and uh, the information that is coming to us from all of our investment partners and all of the econo uh, economic research that we follow. We don't know for sure, but that's our best estimate. It could be later on. It could be in this, uh, the third quarter, but this is our best estimate right now. So it really doesn't matter all that much, right? Whether we are in a recession or will be in a recession, the impact is the same. It's just a question of when. So that leads to big question number four. What's the outlook for the market in 2023? Well, if a recession is likely, doesn't that mean the market's gonna have a meltdown, right? Don't they go hand in hand? Won't politics play a role, you know? I don't like the direction our country's going, so that must mean that the market's going to be in the toilet, right? Don't, don't people feel lousy right now? Doesn't everybody feel bad about things? So it's probably not going to be good for the market, right? And all this volatility up and down, the wild swings, isn't that a bad thing? So let's talk about each one of these. Don't recessions cause market meltdowns? The answer is yes but not in the way that you think. Recessions take time. They don't happen overnight. Now, in the case of COVID, it did happen overnight because we shut down the entire economy. That was a black swan. Typical recessions take time. And generally, a recession is declared 12 to 18 months from the time that the Federal Reserve begins raising interest rates. 
They started raising rates in February of this year, February, March. So 12 to 18 months would put us in the second quarter of next year, somewhere in that range. But what you have to understand about the market and the economy, they're not the same thing, okay? The economy measures what happened in the past. When you hear about the economic report, it's already happened. The market is an indication of what we believe, a prediction of what we believe about the future. We're not investing based on the past usually. I mean, we might look at trends and historical returns to inform our long-term decisions. But in terms of how we're going to invest for next year, usually it's based on how we feel today. The market is a leading indicator. The market moves before the economy does. And typically, the market is in bear territory, where we are right now, in advance of the recession, before it occurs. Conversely, the market is usually on its way back up by the time the economy is declared in recession. So yes, recessions cause market meltdowns, but really what causes the market meltdown is the fear of recession before it happens. And by the time it happens, how do we feel? We feel optimistic. When, when our sentiment, how we feel is in the depths of despair, there's really nowhere to go but up, right? So that's what's important. If a recession is declared in the second quarter of next year, the market if it hasn't already started to rebound, it's probably going to start during then. The rebound will happen, and it will happen quickly, and it will happen quietly. No one will know that on a given day, oh, the S&P was up 1.5% on April 15th. Oh, that's a dirty day, right? Tax day. We don't want to talk about that. Well, now I have some CPAs on. Well, our CPAs, they don't like tax day either, right? They're business owners. You guys don't like tax day any more than we do, right? Um, but that's what you need to know about the relationship between recessions, the economy and the market. They're not the same thing. So don't think of them synonymously. They're not. The market moves ahead of the economy. Now take a look at this chart. And this is an, this, this highlights what I just said. I know there's a lot going on here, but let's focus on this. So these are recessions that have occurred, um, through COVID. All right. What we want to take, pay, pay attention to is the movement of the market a year or so before the recession, and then what happens to the market after the recession. So look at this column where it says 12 months before. It's right in the middle. Look what the market typically does or did 12 months before each one of these recessions. Negative, negative. Now, the market, the economy was not in recession. At the time, the market was negative. Okay? And then look at the economy, the market six months before the recession. A lot of negatives in there. Some positives, but a lot of negatives. The average return of the stock market in the 12 months before a recession was minus 3%. The market moves in advance of the recession. Look what happened to the market during the recession. Okay. The performance is better, right? In that first column, during the recession, the average return of the market during the recession is just minus 1%. Better than the 12 months before that. But then... Look at the market after the recession. Six months after a recession is declared, the market averages 7%. 12 months, it averages 16%. Two years, 20%. You see, the market does pull back and it's painful. And they're not fun conversations. That, you know, I'll say this about our clients. We've done a decent, a good enough job setting expectations and focusing on income and not running out of money. We're not chasing stock market returns. That's a bad way to invest. If you want to do it, go for it. It's not what we do here at Chapelwood. We're not playing the beat the stock market game because in order to beat the stock market, you have to take on more risk than the stock market. And most of our clients don't want that, not for all of their money. The game we're trying to play and is a lot easier to win is don't run out of money in retirement. That's a lot easier game to win. And when you see these kinds of performance after a recession, 
And then you look at your income plan and you've got your near term money and your medium term money and your long term money. You realize that long term money, which has taken the biggest beating this year because it's my most aggressive bucket. I'm not touching that bucket for 20 more years. I think I have some time for it to recover. That's how you sleep at night, right? If you live and die with the movements of the S&P 500, you're not sleeping as well at night, especially during this. You feel great when the market's up 25% and you feel like a genius. You don't feel as good when the market's down. But what I wanted you to see was that the relationship between recessions and market, they're almost opposite of each other or they move independently of one another. And the market is usually on its way back up by the time a recession is declared. Won't politics play a role? Oh, that's not the same thing that I wanted to put. Uh, okay. So here's what I wanted to show you. There is actually a pattern to the four-year presidential election cycle when it comes to the market. Maybe, you've, maybe you know that. Maybe you've never seen this. All right. The worst performing year out of a four-year presidential cycle is the midterm year, the second year, the year we're in now. Now, there's a lot of academic discussion as to why this is true, but I think the answer is simple. In a midterm year, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? We don't know what we're going to get with Congress. We don't. We do now. Democrats retain control of the Senate, and it's looking, I don't, I haven't seen the news today, it's looking like the Republicans are going to take control of the House of Representatives. That's actually a good thing for the market, and not because it likes Republicans or Democrats. The market likes gridlock because it knows that for two years, nothing's going to change. Taxes are probably not going to go up. Government spending is probably not going to go up. The market likes gridlock in Congress. It may not be great for getting anything done, but as far as the market's concerned, no news is good news. So the second year, the midterm year is usually the worst performing, but then look there towards the end of the year, it jumps up. Why? That happens after the midterms are over. Now we know what we're going to get. We feel better about the future, or at least we don't feel as uncertain. The best performing year in a four-year cycle, year three, the year we're getting ready to go into. Look at that performance. Look how the S&P moves in the third year. Now, that's going to be interesting for next year because if we expect a recession next year, that is going to weigh on the market in the first half of the year. But that means there's a chance that in the second half of the year, we're going to see it take off. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But if we use history as a guide and the way the market has moved in a four-year presidential cycle, next year could be a pretty good year. All right? Politics is important to you. It's important to me. It's important to us individually. Okay, so I'm not discounting the importance of your personal beliefs. But as far as the market goes, it doesn't really care about politics. It doesn't. It doesn't care about red or blue. You know what the market cares about? You know what the market's favorite color is? Green. Right? Long term, the market cares little for politics. From 1926 through 2020, Staying in the market generated returns regardless, positive returns, regardless of which party controlled Congress. Market doesn't care. Interest rates, inflation, taxes, consumer spending, employment, and regulation, those factors impact the market far more than politics ever will. That's what the market cares about. If you're using election outcomes to dictate your future investment decisions, that usually ends up leading to unreliable results. So however you personally feel about the outcome of the midterm, don't transfer those emotions to your 401k or your IRA or your trust accounts, all right? Don't do it because the market does what the market does regardless of who's in power. Don't people feel lousy right now? Yeah, they sure do. A lot of people do. Consumer sentiment is at one of its lowest points in recent memory. At the beginning of the year, it was really high, right? Everything was great. The S&P was at an all-time high back in January, and now here we are. But believe it or not, consumer sentiment being as low as it is, is actually a good thing. You don't believe me, do you? You're sitting there thinking, what are you trying to shove down my throat here, King? 
Let me show you. I know there's a lot going on in this chart. This is consumer sentiment. And it's also showing the subsequent return. So it's comparing how do people feel versus how did the market perform? Notice that in February of 2020, consumer sentiment was at a, was at a high point. All right, it was at a high point. But look what happened to the market after that. All right, when the market reaches low points for consumer sentiment, if you look at the little box in the upper left, the average subsequent 12 month, meaning after that point, the average return in the S&P 500 from a peak in consumer sentiment is 4.1%. But the average return from a low in consumer sentiment is 25%. Look where consumer sentiment is right now. September of 2022. Okay. It's low. We feel lousy. But if history holds, from that point, the market is in line for a nice rebound. So again, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but it is what typically happens. You can see it right here. I didn't make these. This comes from JP Morgan. I didn't make this up, right? What about volatility? Isn't it a bad thing? Well, it doesn't feel good to whipsaw back and forth like that. But volatility isn't new. If you've been investing any time in the last year, you know what volatility looks like. In fact, it is not uncommon in a given year, even when the market is up, for us to have major dips intra-year declines. And we average a bear market every three to five years. It happens. Every three to five years, we see a pullback in the market of 20 plus percent. Now, I didn't share another chart with you. Here's one thing we have never seen. This is a true black swan event. It didn't happen until this year. We have never in our history seen bonds and stocks down at least 15% at the same time. If you're investing in stocks and bonds, you're getting hammered in your stocks, you're getting hammered in your bonds as well. We have never ever, at least not in the research that I found, we have never ever seen bonds and stocks be down minus 15% or more in the same year. But we have it this year. But check this out. Here's the S&P 500 going back to 1980. Now, what you're seeing here is the gray bar is how did the market end that year? But the dots, the red dots underneath, that represents the low point for that year. Okay? And the gray negative number represents the pullback to get us there. So, for example, let's pick uh, the year, well, so let's take 2020. 2020 right here ended up third from the right plus 16%. Do you remember that? It was such a horrible year with COVID. The market was actually up 16%, but at one point it was minus 34%. Look at that turnaround, right? Look at some of these other years where the S&P 500 ended positive, but at one point in the year, it was minus. It happens. Despite average intra-year drops of 14%, meaning that the market dropped at some point an average of 14% each year, annual returns going back 42 years, only 10 years out of 42 years did the S&P 500 end up negative. The point of this is to show you that you are not investing for any one year. You are investing for consistency over a long period of time. If you are investing from year to year or day to day or month to month, you are not an investor. You are a trader. You are trading. That's not investing. Investing is a long-term activity. And if you keep this in mind, and you've got different buckets of money, 
at different levels of risk, doing different things for different phases of your life, then your conservative money that you're using right now is going to get you through the next several years. That more aggressive money, it's going to take a chin shot every now and then. But it has time to recover. Okay. And again, here's long term growth. If you look at just one year, if you look at the far left, yeah, I mean, the value of stocks and bonds can fluctuate wildly. But if you look at the 20 year rolling average, and if you're at the average retirement is 25 to 30 years, okay, you see, you don't have as much volatility if you have a plan and you stay committed to it. Doesn't mean you don't make adjustments, but you have to have a plan and you have to stay committed to that plan over time. So what is our outlook for 2023? We do believe that the Fed will continue raising interest rates through March 2023. We believe at that point that the Fed will then take a pause and they will let interest rates sit there, whether that's at 4.75 or 5%. And keep in mind, the Fed's rate, their target rate does not correspond exactly to mortgage rates or, or any other loan rates or savings rates or investing rates. That's not how it works. But their top rate, we think, is going to end up somewhere at five or just below five. And we think that they'll stop around March 2023, give their rate increases time to continue to do their work. And the combined impact of all that, we believe, right now will lead to a recession being declared in the second quarter of 2023, maybe quarter three. However, we also believe that the market rebound will occur while we're in the recession. So that's why you don't want to make major investment changes when the recession's declared, because that's probably when the market's going to rebound. Where, when have we been making changes to our clients that want it? We've been making them now in preparation. Uh, one, of, one of my clients, and I think she's on today, Mary Sue, we just saw her yesterday, and she, she, gave, she used one of the best phrases I've heard. We just want to slow down some of the bleeding, Okay. We just want to stop the bleeding a little bit, okay? What can we do to kind of get out of the way a little bit? We don't want to go all the cash because later on, there are going to be some buying opportunities. Um, we expect a good second half of 2023. And right now, 5% would be good, right? We'll, we'll take 5%. Can we just have 5%? And we believe that there's a decent probability of positive returns by the end of the year. So it is uh, right now 129. We've only got maybe a minute here for uh, questions. And I'm sorry I didn't leave more time for questions, but are there any questions right now? I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions you have. If you do have questions and you want to ask those questions offline, you can get to me, uh, go to, uh, you can message me on LinkedIn. You can go look for my LinkedIn profile. I'd be happy and just send me a private message. Happy to answer a question there. You can email me at damon at chapelwood.com, D-A-M-O-N at C-H-A-P-P-E-L-W-O-O-D.com. You can text a question to 405-348-0909, or you can just call me at 405-348-0909 and uh, ask your question. All right, we do have a question that's come up here. How Kathy says, how have your predictions for 2022 held up compared to this time last year? So, yeah, at the end of 2021, Kathy, we we were believing that there was going to be some volatility. Now, I'm not going to lie. We thought that there was a chance that the market would actually end up positive by the end of the year. We did. And we said that kind of February, March. At that time, we didn't see the decline like we'd seen. And we were, we were basing a lot of what we were saying off of what the Fed was saying, okay? And at that time, they still believed that inflation was gonna be transitory. What they did not account for. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Chris says, extremely well done. Thank you, Damon. Thank you so much for that, Chris. I'm glad that you were able to come on today. One mistake that the Federal Reserve made is that when they said that inflation was going to be transitory and therefore they didn't think they were going to have to really raise rates at all at that time. They did not account for they they saw they thought that prices were going to stabilize what they didn't account for was that people would shift their spending. 
to services. That spending would go away from goods because inflation did fall for a period of time, but then it rose back up and it was because of services. I don't know how they didn't think about that, but they didn't. So we expected the market to have some volatility and start the first half of the year down, but we expected it to end up positive. Obviously, that part hasn't come true because there have been other circum other information came available, which obviously we have now. So in that regard, yeah, we, we didn't get that one. But we did expect the volatility. And, you know, that's why I, I don't know where the market's going to end up. But right now, it's setting up based on what we've seen with recessions in the market in the past and the way the Fed raises rates. We are expecting a rebound sometime in 2023, maybe not until the second half of 2023. That's probably going to be the best place, uh, the, the best estimate that we have right now. I don't even call it a prediction because a prediction says that I had, know something about the future that you don't. I don't, but I am making an estimate based on the information and, uh, you know, kind of our, the research that we have. All right. Yeah, thank you. Kathy says, thank you. I think the presentation was helpful as well. I appreciate your work to inform. Just trying to compare. You're right, absolutely. Uh, Ken says, thank you, David. Appreciate you holding this call. Very informative. Thank you for inviting me. Ken, I was really glad that you were able to be on as well. And I want to say uh, thank you to all of our uh, guests, especially all of our wonderful clients. Kathy is uh, one of those. Um, we've got a lot of our wonderful clients on the call today. So I do want to give you guys a shout out. Okay, I promise I'm not using any last names, just first names, but I want to say hi to Forrest. I want to say hi to Jay, Kathy, uh, Mary, it's good to see you on, Nancy, Ralph, uh, Bob, it's good to see you. I owe you a blueberry muffin at some point. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, yeah, you sure do. I, I need to see you at some point because I, you know, I want to hear, I want to hear if you hit it big at the at the casino lately. Um and, and I'll get you a, a blueberry muffin whenever that time comes. Uh, Wendy, it's good to see you. We've had some folks drop off because they had to. So anyway, thanks to all of our wonderful clients. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'd love to hear what you think. I am going to post this recording. It'll be on our YouTube channel, Financial Diva. You can get to that, but I'll also send it out to everybody. So thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. And until next time, stay prosperous. Think positive thoughts. And always, always keep this in mind. Consistency will always outperform occasional brilliance. And that's the key to investing. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.